So, so you, you know, you'd already got and involved it was just like, playing since. Well, the, the, Mark White was the singer in the band. I wasn't the singer, but I just started singing. And at that point, they said to me, "You can be the singer now." So I kind of took the role. Yeah. Uh, but before but that's, that, that's the had, first you, time. had no, you ever done? Had you ever, had you ever sung lead before or anything no, like no, that? No, no, no. Really? And no. you just those options. You just went, went for it. Yeah, you just went for it. That was. That's amazing. It was. Uh, yeah, that was it. That was it. Yeah. And were you were you sort of like that was the moment. nervous or uh... no? I felt natural. And then we did a couple of shows, you know, like at the art college in Sheffield and stuff. And then you learn, yeah, there's all that adrenaline before you get on stage. But then when you get on stage, it just feels like coming home. Yeah, even though what you're doing might be pre pretty limited, there's an audience. You're on stage, and it does feel like coming home. Yeah, I don't know where that comes from. But yeah, anyway. it's, well, it's served just me well natural, since. natural talent. Yeah, it's I don't just, know. I don't know. It's uh, what's just talent serendipity though? as well. Ninety-eight percent perspiration, eight two percent inspiration. You know. Yeah, it's true. Maybe that's talent. But it, yeah, well, it certainly served you well. But it's luck. Yeah, it's luck. And and uh, how did ABC? How did your involvement with ABC? And you know, how how did this? How did the start of the the band kind of? Evolved. It evolved out of another band, didn't it? Yeah, a band called uh, Vice Versa. We played like Leeds Futurama, and we were like 79th on the bill. Leeds Futurama was like in this warehouse in Leeds. It was terrifying. It was like grim. And we, but we were on Sunday afternoon, Sunday morning, very early, because the further down you're on the bill, the earlier you go on. And I think we were 79th on the bill, 76th. But Depeche Mode were like 78th on the bill, and and. Um, yeah. Soft Cell, Mark Ullman's band, were on the same bill. They were 77th on the bill. So it was a kind of a great time to be coming through, yeah, with our little synthesizers. But um, Vice Versa was a pretty successful band, yeah. John Peel would play the music on Radio 1 late at night and stuff. But we felt that we wanted to kind of, the music was changing, you know, we wanted it to be more, much more polished and uh, funky, I suppose. So. At that point, ABC sort of emerged. We, we got involved with a bass player and a drummer and we brought them in and we changed the band around dramatically, yeah. So one week we were vice versa and the next week we were ABC. And, why, and, and if, if the band had been sort of successful and, yeah, and being, yeah. being played by John Peel and stuff, how, how come you guys decided to change the name and really, you know, make... Was it just to go in a completely new direction? Yeah, yeah, I think... We'd seen the future, yeah. We'd seen that to some degree. And also living in Sheffield, the Human League were there, you know, doing brilliantly. Uh, Cabaret Voltaire, Clock DVA, there were all these brilliant bands, Def Leppard, uh, Heaven 17, I suppose, Pulp. There were all these brilliant bands, but in electronics, you know, the league were the last word. They were like defining it. So I suppose it was time for us to kind of go the next step and to do something. Because all you want to do when you're, you're young is be original. You want to be the first to everything, don't you? Yeah. You want yeah. to climb Everest, don't you? <laughs> you know. For sure. There's a big part of that when you're in a band. So that's why ABC formed. Yeah. And so you got. I don't know why. So you were very. It's ambitious. illogical, but uh, that's what that was. That was definitely what happened. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, it suggests ambition and confidence as well, because it's like you know you've had some initial success, but your yeah. your new vision inspires you so much and makes you so confident that you're going to make that change. Yeah, it's like um, ignorance. It's bliss. <laughs> it's like stupidity. I've always thought that's a big part of success. Blind, uh, putting blinkers on basically, yeah, because you can make a lot Tunnel of mistakes. Vision. Tunnel vision, yeah. And I think that's essential. Yeah. Definitely. And did, so did you gig as ABC bef before yeah. making the lexicon of love? Oh, yeah, yeah. We gigged, uh, played a lot. Played, um, yeah, in the UK. I yeah. played, played a whole bunch of shows. And. How how were those kind of early early gigs and you know how you know how much did did you gig for example before making that first that first ABC record? Uh, played clubs, played art colleges. Um, yeah, we were kind of we, uh, we we were reviewed, you know, in the NME, which was the bible of the time. You know, the Inkies, the, the Melody Maker, and the NME. So it meant that a lot of uh, guys from record companies in London would drive up to Sheffield to come and meet us and sort of talk about maybe getting a record deal and stuff, you know. There was definitely a buzz about ABC, like a lot of acts. But um, it was a cottage industry, yeah, that's the beautiful thing about the 1980s that people forget. It was completely cottage industry, homemade. 
like the clothes you'd you kind of go to a jumble sale and, and buy some you know old granddad's waistcoat or something or his old tweed suit and take it home and wear it you know uh same with the music yeah it was a, it was a very kind of grassroots scene in sheffield yeah definitely and, uh, and what did you guys pl- what did you guys play at those early gigs before the first record was made was it originals or yeah yeah it was all uh, it was all the songs that are on the lex gonna love yeah those so songs. before you recorded them you were yeah, playing, yeah 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 we were just building up our repertoire a couple of songs we ditched along the way but yeah we were we were kind of fusing these two worlds that we love so much uh there was the kind of joy division and cure and the sort of british rock scene and also uh, the funk and soul records we love like james brown and disco records like earth wind and fire um Blood, a lot of stuff on z records uh it's just with this sort of mania to sort of try and compete with american dance music yeah but funnily enough a lot of other bands were kind of in their own uh experimental studios doing the same thing and i think that's definitely what led to the success of so duran duran or uh, culture club and those other acts that came through yeah i think that was definitely in the air i don't know why but that's definitely what was it the 80s was about and like a fusion of, of different of styles. different sounds yeah rock was dead yeah rock was dead and you guys worked course with Trevor Horton on yeah. Lexicon kind of Love um, and you know he's he's sort of been described as like you know the well, all sorts of things but you know certainly was a defining producer of, of the 80s oh um, yeah Trevor's a skilled and, guy and how how influential was was he on on producing that um that yeah sound? it was a big influence on the record of course uh, we'd had a we'd had a hit with Tears Not Enough and we wanted to work with Alex Sackin who'd made the Grace Jones records we met Alex Sackin and we naively, we hadn't really, we wanted him to make the, uh, we wanted to work with him. I loved the stuff he did on Ireland, uh, my Jamaican guy, and uh, it's just so many brilliant records. But on those records, I realize now on those records is uh, Sly and Robbie, they're the rhythm section, they're incredible. So it was kind of, it was a big ask for a kind of a band from Sheffield, you know, we were only very young to have those musical skills and those musical chops. But um, we never got to work with Alex Sackin. So I just remember Mark White came in and he'd heard a record on the radio, uh, Handheld in Black and White by Dollar. And it was just this incredible widescreen production and Trevor Horn had produced it. So we contacted Trevor, yeah. And um, hooked up with Trevor uh, at Psalm East and started recording, I think we started recording Poison Arrow. That was the first thing we worked on together. Yeah. And then- And did you know from there that it was gonna be yeah, it felt good because Trevor was coming at it from a different angle. He'd had worked with a lot of kind of like quite show business acts uh, and he'd yeah. been very successful with Buggles and yeah. he, he was the lead singer in Yes. But we were kind of coming at it from Sheffield. You know, we had a very different art pop view of the world. So, but yeah, we all came together and worked with Anne Dudley, Gary Langan, JJ. But you, you immediately realised Trevor, yeah, he, he was really, uh, the, the, the main thing about, I remember he was, he was really opinionated. Yeah, he was really opinionated. Like we sat in a pizza place at the bottom of Queensway and we're chatting to him, telling him how we're going to be the future of rock and roll and we're, we're going to be brilliant and we've got all these songs, you know, we're doing our pitch. And he gets up and he goes, excuse me a second, and he goes to the uh, people in the pizza parlour, can you just turn this music off please? It, t- it, t- it sounds like lift music. <laughs> and I kind of thought, yeah, yeah, that's the guy we should be working with, really. You know? So he's very sort of yeah, he's very frank. frank. Yeah, very frank in opinion. Yeah, it's great. And so from that, uh, so it wasn't. I don't know. I don't know what it was like working with Phil Spector or someone. Now Trevor has a very defined image of him yeah, as a producer. Of uh, as but at the author. time, was it was just you uh, know, maybe it was like was working with that. Scorsese. I don't know, but like. No, he was definitely skilled, and he had a lot to prove, as we did, as the band. So, so was he it was like ev- really it was like everybody then? focused? Yeah, I, I guess. And you, got, you guys would have been as well. Yeah, yeah. I so, it's like the per- I mean, because that album is there was some alchemy there. Yeah, and I think if you ask Trevor about that recording experience, yeah, you, you, he'd maybe say the same thing. There was something going on. There was some magic in the air. Yeah, definitely, because yeah, yeah, it's tough. You, you don't come across that every day of the week. You know, some days you're 
you're making a record and it's like you're putting down the foundations and building the walls, putting the windows in and the roof on the thing. But um, some days it's just like, you know, I don't know. How long did it take you guys to make that record? It was a really, uh, the Let's Gonna Love is quite an elaborate sounding record and people think it's yeah. orchestrated throughout, but it isn't really. There's a lot of Selena, a string machine and samples and stuff mixed in with some real strings. Uh, there are strings on All of My Heart and The Look of Love, there's some pizzicatos and various par parts of, bits of the record, we did strings. But we wanted to make something that was very, uh, at the time, very polished, different from the po sort of post-punk world we, we come from. We wanted to make something brand new. Yeah, that's what it was about. And uh, how it's long it called take? one of the best um, albums, you know, literally know. ever in the UK. Uh, well, people say that, but that's very kind. But and and well, ever, in, ever in, in pop music, it's literally, refer, you know, it's, it's a masterpiece. People, th uh, it was made over like, uh, I think it was made over an 8, 10, 12 week period. So we'd had a hit with Poison Arrow. So we had to go out and promote it. And then uh, Look of Love we recorded. And then we finished the album. And we remixed uh, Tears Not Enough, I think. So it was kind of being, yeah, it was being made while we were becoming pop stars, I suppose, and kind of becoming famous, yeah. It was was that an exciting time. Yeah. Was that a co just a completely magical time for you guys? Or was it, st yeah. was it, was it stressful at all? Or was it just no. like riding a, a wave of, you know, you guys were on a high? Yeah, it was a, it was a high. It was just, um, you know, in a way, I think if we hadn't made the record then, somebody else would have made it somewhere you know, along the line. You know, we were... Uh, We'd use Psalm East, which is a re was a really is still a very small studio in the East End of London. Psalm uh, Trevor later got involved with and built Psalm West, but um, so we'd run out of studio time, and we ended up in Good Earth Studios, Tony Visconti's studio, and David Bowie came to the sessions. That was a trip because we wow. loved Bowie, you know. That's full circle He's for you personally. He's standing in the studio well. listening to our music, you know, in the control room. Yeah. Um, so that would be like a Tuesday, Thursday, then we moved to Rack Studios on a Friday to finish off. So it was kind of a pretty nomadic way of recording when I think back. Uh, but it wasn't like 18 months sort of trying to conjure up something that the public had liked. It was definitely just like blam, blam, blam. That's how the record was made. And in a way, uh, that kind of worked well because it had an, an energy of its own at the time with songs like uh, Look of Love, I suppose, and you know, uh, Many Happy Returns, All of My Heart. The, the songs that were on that album, yeah. And, and as, as the, you know, 80s continue, you guys made a lot of other good records, and I think... Yeah, in different ways. Many, uh, it, does it, it, does it totally annoy you that people focus so much on the lexicon of love? No, not at all. Um, with the third record, we made a, an album called How To Be A Zillionaire, where everything was electronic on that record. Uh, so it meant recording it uh i mean it sounds ridiculous now but in, in 84 recording digitally was kind of a novel ex a new experience we'd have a 3m machine over at jacob studios and um, the guys from 3m would come down and try and we try and push it to the limits but the recording process uh um so yeah we're using fairlight to some degree and emulated emulated too i think you know very very sampling machines We'd always try and push it to the limit each time we made a record. And we were never that interested in, in sounding the same, which was probably folly from a commercial point of view. But um, It made the album it kind of, really interesting. It yeah. means now, if you go back, that there's, there's a story and there's, there's a body of work to listen to, yeah. But, um, uh, you know, I think if you're in a band, you know, when I listen to sort of Walter Beck or Donald Fagan, I kind of think they followed their own kind of path with Steely Dan, you know, I admire that, or Bowie, or, you know, the Roxy music, bands like that, I just think that's, that's what it's about, being as experimental as you possibly can, you know, even when you're commercially successful. I think it's the same with films, same with painting, I think that's important, but in a way we should have made 10 Lexicon of Loves, yeah, that would have, uh, but it must, that would have been a different it experience. Was, it was such a groundbreaking masterpiece that it's, I think it's really good that you but you guys made make, different records after. And we they're, we they're, wanted to make really stuff good. that was romantic uh, because it was like kind of doing the, op doing the opposite of what the other guys in the rehearsal room were next door were doing. That's definitely what we were about. It was to kind of wind people up. It was to entertain them. But it was kind of, that, that's kind of a punky uh, attitude, really. You don't, 
it's less you see that sometimes now but things seem to be very uh generic you know yeah back then now the only way to get any attention was to try and uh, go against the grain yeah and the, I, I really love the song when Smokey sings like that oh, yeah. that seems such an unusual way of because usually when people pay tribute it's really kind of like backhanded they don't like credit the tribute yeah they just yeah. sort of like slightly imitate something. They need the best ideas. Yeah, and then they don't really say where, where whereas you guys were sort of, and you know, is, was Smokey a big influence for you guys? Yeah, I mean, um, when Smokey sings is about Smokey Robinson, but it's about um, R&B, yeah. When I was like 14, the first club I'd go to, Cheadle Hume Youth Club, you'd see all these kind of people there. The, uh, back then it was all skinheads and suede heads, and, which was kind of a whole subcultures and gangs. Whenever a great record came on, everybody hit the dance floor. Do you know what I mean? The kids you knew from school. You know, it was just a whole kind of... And I would kind of... You just get it. You, you realise that, you know, the music does bring people together. And uh, I was listening... Back then, when I was doing it in this club, it was like Motown and Stax and, uh, I guess, R&B. Just early disco tunes, I suppose. So, when Smokey Sings is... Uh, yeah, it's about Smokey Robinson and, uh, you know, Marvin Gaye and, and all those. All those great Wonder. R&B and soul records. I love The Temptations. I still do. I, I really love those productions Norman Whitfield uh, put together on The Temptations records. I like music that kind of comes on along in any era, which kind of st steps outside the definition of what you should be doing in that moment in time. You know? And The Temptations, when you hear Papa Was a Rolling Stone or Cloud Nine or Runaway Child and stuff... Uh, it's from any era, you know, it just, it just sounds one. I love Sly Stone, Sly and the Family Stone. Yeah. They were totally experimental Brilliant. pieces of music. That you, you can listen to them today and they still confound you. Do you know what I mean? I love that. Yeah, That's they're still, they still yeah. just sound like nothing, like but, uh, nothing else. When Smokey Sings anything. was a great chance to, yeah, doff the cap to, I mean, he's a great lyricist. Yeah, uh, Bob Dylan described him as America's yeah. greatest living poet. I love the lyrics. Um, the, the funny thing was, uh, the first TV show we did was in Holland, uh, Top Pop, and um, we, we went down there, and uh, we there to promote When Smokey Sings. We walked down the corridor, and there's the ABC star in the dressing room, and then there's Smokey Robinson next door. So wow. I don't know if they set it up or anything, so I got a copy of the seven-inch vinyl, and I knocked on the door, and I said, oh, you know, hello, Mr. Robinson, here's a, here's a, here's a record we've made, you know. And did he great. like it? Yeah, yeah. About, I mean, That's he probably cool. thought, who the hell is this guy, you know? But about three, four weeks later, we met him in Los Angeles, and the records have both gone into the top five in America. You know, they're both big hits, his record and, and West Wing Sings. And he invited uh, Mark White and myself uh, down to Motown and stuff. He was the MD of Motown at the time. That's uh, awesome. It was so cool, yeah. It must have been yeah. such a great So memory. I kind of realised you should write, you, you be careful what you write about, you know. Uh, they're all self-fulfilling prophecies you know yeah be careful what you wish for it's cool <laughs> and so it's great you know to write a song and then meet the guy involved you know yeah incredible yeah and so you've had great longevity and uh also you you know you took you took a risk um when you wrote the, the lexicon of love 2 and released that yeah yeah how do, now that it's been it's been a few years since then how do you how do you feel that that record stacks up um, yeah, it's a strong record. I, I, for years, people were saying, would you ever revisit the, uh, you know, the gold lame and the, the red velvet of uh, the lexicon of love? And I was playing a show at the Albert Hall and I looked out into the audience and the kind of whole, we, it was an orchestral show we were doing and the, the audience was going crazy. And I kind of thought to myself, well, the real story is about what's happened to everybody in the kind of interim between the two records. So... I started writing some really songs about being, not about being 17, but about being an older, you know, uh, surviving all those decades. And I think people kind of like that. So the record, uh, yeah, came out in 2016, I think. Yeah. And it did really well here in the UK. So yeah, it, was a it kind of felt good. It, it was... Um, and it got radio play as well, didn't yeah. it? It was like A-listed on Radio 2 and... When you stand on a stage, sometimes you'll play a record, you'll, you'll perform a song, you know, that you may have written 20 years ago, but the secret is to kind of turn it into the moment. You know, you flip, 
you're making it real in that moment in time and the audience when it clicks they kind of forget the mortgage payments and the expanding waistline and all the kind <laughs> of trials and tribulations of growing up and they're kind of there in that moment well when it came to make the record i thought i want to put instead of me re-recording the old songs and you know doing orchestral versions like everybody does i'm going to write f some new material but it's going to it's going to we're going to shade it and it's going to appear like it's the the brother to the lex going to love and that's how that came about yeah like the like the kind of the book like telling the story to bookend. Later. yeah to bookend it or maybe there'll be a lexicon of love free though well you, you know, know i don't want to ruin the franchise in case in case it's all franchises just, now <laughs> you know the matrix was the first franchise exactly I kind of thought it was cool but like now i mean you know netflix you know season nine exactly you know, stuff. so you so i don't i don't the walking dead's on permanently in my house so <laughs> or you know uh yeah, yeah, but I still think I, I I really do think it was a it was a brilliant idea and well thank you and, yeah uh, I'm really glad that you did it and and as you say you know writing new music is much better than just re-recording and doing it doing well, it differently and stuff it's a I challenge mean, not necessarily better, it's a massive it's challenge harder. because uh, over a long period of time you know how do you sustain interest in what what you're doing is tough and a lot of the acts I play with they they don't really do play record much new material you know so. I kind of admire people like Bruce Springsteen. I thought his last record was brilliant, you know. It's kind of these vignettes, these stories of a people living in America in the 50s and 60s. Yeah, I, I, I kind of, I thought that was as good as Born to Run and Greetings from Ashbury Park, you know, so. It's just hard for people with, with hits. Yeah. It's the same challenge that you face. When I say Bruce Springsteen, I mean somebody who's written a many, many, many songs. Yeah, how'd you show? Uh, because when, you, when you're playing a show, people probably want to hear that you know they definitely want to hear the hits but you play shows like in different places yeah with an orchestra if you're playing for two hours they, they want to hear the hits but if you play for 30 minutes they want to hear hits it depends where you're where you're standing what, what stage you're standing on yeah but um, but um it's still good to yeah it's still good to write new songs yeah yeah i hope i hope you continue to do yeah. so so uh, what what i wanted to finish the interview with yeah um and there's so much to touch on in interviews like this um it's, it's difficult to cover everything. So I always like to ask, what are your favorite deep cuts from your catalog? Because anyone can go on Spotify oh, and yeah. listen, to, listen to the hits, but it's always interesting to hear from the artist. Where are the, you know, those kind of, those chestnuts from, from albums that people may not you know, immediately click on that are just- uh, ABC really stuff, you mean? Yeah, uh, yeah, yeah. Um, well, with those, they all go, always go to Look of Love, and uh, I guess all in my heart, uh, Poison Arrow, When Smokey Sings, Night Middle Love. Um, there's a song called Paper Thin we wrote. Uh, it was going to be on uh, Alphabet City, but there wasn't enough space, so it kind of comes. It came out on an album called Up, and I always love that song. But uh, I, guess, I guess that's a deep cut. Yeah, that's kind of. <laughs> it's a pretty dark song though. Sometimes when you write uh, and put together an album, you kind of, you, you kind of. It's finding the right recipe, the right tilt, you know, the right balance between the positive stuff and the negative, the dark stuff. So I yeah. guess that's why I wouldn't use it. But that's a nice, uh, the song I, I really enjoy. But I don't I'll know. I'll check it out. Uh, there's over 100 ABC songs out there, I guess. So, yeah, so. I don't it's know. a big catalogue to listen to. Um, Fear of the World's another song we on uh, Zillionaire where we it clicked, where the 4M digital side of thing came together with the sound. And, uh, but, you know, I if know. there's a full record, I feel bad. To kind that's of not the lexicon in the of love. Because um, full record that's not the lexicon of love that you think, you know, people should alongside the lexicon of love highlight this record. Lex two. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Well, I thought I thought I did think it was uh, really impressive to follow up in that way after uh, you know after a big gap um, and an ambitious project. Well. Um, my final question is, um, this is called Greatest of All Time, this series, so... Who I like a bit of hype of oil. That's a very exaggerated title. Well, you know... What's the question, sorry? It's, uh, who, who, are your, who are your greatest of all time? And this is, you know, you're a, deserve, you're a deserved inclusion. You, you oh, know, you're not, uh, you're not a kind, member of the... Uh, Songwriters. Uh, Lou Reed, Paul Simon. Songwriters. People that just kind of find it from somewhere. You know, they pluck it up from the earth somewhere. Lou Reed, I love Lou Reed. Uh, 
Paul Simon, Bowie, put Ferry in there and Sly Stone. That's a pretty formidable five. Very formidable five. Yeah. Well, Martin, thank you very thank much you. for taking the time. Thanks very much.